But the International Court of Justice has ordered Israel to halt its invasion into Rafah. To talk about this latest development, I'm going to be joined by Trita Parsi, who's the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, first, let's go to the International Court of Justice, which announced its ruling, uh, which read the ruling out in the courtroom. Uh, here's a brief portion of that. The court considers that in conformity with the obligation under the Genocide Convention, Israel must immediately hold its military offense and any other action in the Rafah governorate, which may inflict on the Palestinian group in Gaza conditions of life that could bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. What, is that, what does that mean? The International Court of Justice has ordered Israel to stop its invasion. I understand what it means when a court orders me to stop doing something. Like, I better do it or there are going to be consequences. Uh, what, what could be the consequences here and how significant is this ruling? So let's take the significance of it first. As you remember, a couple of months ago, the South Africans demanded, they went and they asked for the court to uh, issue a halt for Israel's operation in Gaza as a whole, essentially calling for a ceasefire. And as part of its original uh, um, application to the court in regards to genocide, the court essentially agreed that there was enough basis for a genocide needed to investigate it, but did not fully uh, and explicitly call for a ceasefire. The South Africans have been at it. They've gone back to the court over and over again, and finally they got an order for a halt, not for a complete ceasefire, but uh, in Rafa. This is very, very crucial. Now, the question as to what happens next and can the court enforce it, et cetera. Let's first remind ourselves of one thing. The ICC, which made a ruling last week uh, in regards to war crimes, is a court that neither the United States nor Israel are actually state parties to. And as a result, it is easier for them to ignore it. But for countries that are party to them, they cannot ignore it. So if, for instance, Netanyahu were to travel to Germany, the Germans have now come out and said they would arrest him if the actual war crimes uh, arrest orders are issued. With the ICJ, it's different. It is binding for all states. This is, there is no escape clause for Israel or any other country from that, but they do not have enforcement capacity. So this will then have to go to the Security Council. And I will suspect that we will see a resolution put forward, hopefully in rather short order, by some state in the Security Council, most likely Algeria, that will demand that the court ruling of the ICJ is fulfilled by Israel. And then they have a Security Council Chapter 7 ruling, and that is enforceable. And if that is not then enforced, and I, in my view, we should already have gone to this point, that's when you go to actions, and that could be sanctions and other measures against Israel. This should have been stopped long time ago. Um, and, and But nevertheless, we are now at a point in which we are looking closer towards actual enforcement sanctions against Israel to make sure that its mass killings and atrocities in Gaza are stopped. What's your assessment of what the U.S. would do if, say, Algeria or somebody else does bring a resolution to the Security Council? Uh, you know, the last time they let a resolution go through, but that's a slightly different situation. What, what, what do you think? Well, this is really interesting because for the last couple of months, we have seen the almost weekly demonstrations of the double standards of the Biden administration. Because the Biden administration itself has come out and said that there should not be any major invasion of Gaza. Of course, they've watered out down and they watered out down over and over again. But from the outset, they actually had pretty strong language that it would be unacceptable to go like in. Red Rafa. line around Rafa. Red line, exactly. Well, if Biden is not capable of enforcing his red lines, then perhaps the Security Council and the ICJ has that capacity. So it will put the Biden administration in the bind. The ruling is actually enforcing Biden's own words. Will he veto his own words? I suspect he will, because that is the pattern we have seen so far. But it will be a, a further indication, if we go to the domestic side of the politics of this for the US, that Biden cannot escape this. As long as this fighting continues, he will not have a single week from now till November in which this will not be in the news and which voters will not be reminded of the fact that the United States is aiding and abetting and arming and funding war crimes against civilians in Gaza. What's the relationship between this ruling and the ICC? 
situation where well, they the, recently I, said, and, and, and interestingly, I don't know if you saw this this morning, the German chancellor backed off that claim a little bit. Uh, the, the spokesperson had said, we will definitely, of course, we'll arrest him if he comes here and there's an arrest warrant. The chancellor said, well, that would be up to some judges. I oh, interesting. Yeah. I had not seen that. Well, yeah. that, that is uh, further weakening of uh, uh, Western commitments to the very same institutions uh, Western countries have played a critical role in putting uh, uh, into place. And I want to say a couple of words about how we've seen a shift on that later on, if you allow me. But the comparison between the ICC and the ICJ, again, first of all, uh, the Israelis are not party to the agreement. The Palestinians are, and as a result, the ICC does have uh, jurisdiction there. Uh, but it's more importantly in terms of whether a warrant ultimately is issued, other countries that are party to it will have to implement it. It is binding onto them. It doesn't mean that Netanyahu cannot come to Congress. He can, because the United States, quite shamefully, is not a state party to the ICC mm -hmm. and the Rome Statute. But it will nevertheless be another poke in the eye of uh, the international community if Congress moves forward with inviting Netanyahu, particularly if it happens after actual uh, arrest warrants have been issued. As you know, so far it has not. It's, it's essentially the, the judge saying that he's uh, requesting this, but it has to be reviewed by the court as a whole. Uh, the ICG ruling, of course, is a little bit different because it's not just looking at war crimes, it is looking at genocide. The ICC ruling stayed away from that language altogether. And in this ruling, incidentally, it also demands, it, 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 it calls on Israel to allow investigators in, in order to investigate genocide. It is demanding that Israel now has to collaborate with the efforts to be able to investigate as to whether it has committed genocide or not. The ruling also uh, demanded that Israel open the Rafah border crossing. Uh, they have, they, you know, they have said that they would be willing to open it to, for fuel shipments through Egypt, but Egypt has also been closing it as well. So wh where does, where, what's Egypt's role in all this? And what's your understanding of Egypt's relationship with Israeli control of the Rafah border? Well, I think the primary fear the, Israeli, uh, the Egyptians have is that the Israeli game plan is essentially to create some sort of an opening in which it will shove out all of the uh, Palestinians in Gaza into Egyptian territory, essentially succeed with ethnic cleansing, call them refugees in Egypt. But everyone knows once you have been a refugee and you've left Palestinian territory, it's a very small likelihood that you will be able to make it back, which would then mean that suddenly Egypt's uh, population would grow with two million people, it, uh, an economy that is already on the brink of collapse. So I think that is their primary concern. But it is fair to also say that the Egyptians have not played uh, as constructive of a role as perhaps they could have. Now, of course, they've been a very critical part of the negotiations for uh, a ceasefire, uh, which, uh, again, had it not been for the effort of Qatar and Egypt, we wouldn't have had the first uh, uh, exchange of prisoners, for instance. And so, yeah, your your final point, I want, I want you to get to, I want you to expound on what you were saying about the way that the kind of European and Western production of this international rules-based order is now colliding with this uh this interest in protecting Israel, regardless of what it uh, is doing against the rules of that rules based order. Yeah. And, and so, as you pointed out, you know, one of the favorite terms of the Biden administration, at least in the beginning of his uh, presidency, was to talk about the rules based international order. Interestingly enough, uh, the administration has more or less ceased to use that term since October 7. There's been cases, particularly in relation to Ukraine. Not a single time that I've seen it being used by a senior is, uh, a Biden official in relations to Gaza. And I think that says quite a lot. But what we're seeing here is, again, when the Biden administration is talking about a rules-based order, it is talking about an order in which the U.S. rules, not an order based on rules. And what we're seeing here is that in the past, these institutions, frankly, were designed to be able to uh, be instruments of Western control of uh, 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 the international system. And you had a lot of resistance to the UN and many of these institutions from global South countries in the past, precisely because they saw them as such instruments. And incidentally, uh, uh, the chief prosecutor at uh, the ICC said uh, last week that a Western official, and many people suspect that it's Lindsey Graham, 
had very angrily told him that you don't understand these uh, this institutions and these rules were supposed to be used to go after thugs in Africa and Putin, not Western leaders, which tells you something about that mindset. What has now happened he with the, sh- the assignment? Exactly. Yeah. What has now happened with the shifting balance uh, on a global scale in which we have seen not only uh, power shifting away from the U.S. towards China, but also shifting towards the global south is that global south countries are now successfully using these different institutions as they are supposed to be used to hold everyone accountable to the law, not just some. And this is a major, major shift, particularly if it leads to not just a binding decision by the ICJ, but a UN Security Council resolution that does pass and that actually starts enforcement of some of these rules on Israel. All right, well, we'll stay tuned. Uh, Trita Parsi, thank you so much for joining us uh, on a short, short notice on this Friday morning. Have a good Thank weekend. you so much for having me.